By the closing years of World War II, Britain did something remarkable. While the world's attention was already drifting toward jet engines and swept wings, British engineers quietly built one of the fastest piston engine fighters ever to leave the ground. It was sleek, brutally quick, beautifully balanced, and it never fired a shot in anger. That's the strange part. On paper, this machine was the peak of the piston era. Light wooden structure, big Merlin power, long legs for escort duty. But it arrived just as the age of jets was taking over, and history has a habit of forgetting anything that shows up a little too late. So how does a fighter this advanced, this capable, end up standing on the sidelines? Why did a design that should have been a frontline killer never get the chance to prove what it could really do? This is the story of the de Havilland Hornet. While the Hornet stood poised to become a late war powerhouse, its story really begins thousands of miles from Europe, across the jungles and coastlines of Southeast Asia. Britain wasn't a bystander in the Pacific, far from it. Through India, Burma, Malaya, Hong Kong, and even Papua New Guinea, the British Empire held vast territories that found themselves pulled into Japan's expanding war machine. And keeping those regions supplied, defended, and connected demanded far more than the aircraft Britain had been using in Europe. The Royal Air Force faced a very different kind of enemy in the Pacific. Japanese fighters, especially the A6M0, were astonishingly light on the controls, quick to turn, and lethal in a close-range dogfight. To counter them, Britain needed a fighter that could match that agility while still carrying enough fuel to cover the enormous distances of the theater. Escorting long-range bombers, supporting ground forces across remote fronts, and patrolling far-flung airfields meant endurance mattered just as much as raw speed. By 1943, it was clear the RAF couldn't simply repurpose a European design. The Pacific demanded something purpose-built, an aircraft with the range to cross oceans, the maneuverability to challenge a zero, and the power to escort heavy bombers deep into enemy territory. That requirement set the stage for a new kind of British fighter, the machine that would eventually become the de Havilland Hornet. But to understand why Britain turned to a very specific design philosophy for its next fighter, you have to look at one of the most unforgiving fronts of the entire war, Burma. Out there, the enemy wasn't always wearing a uniform. The real killer was the jungle itself. Heat, humidity, stagnant water, and endless monsoon rains created a perfect breeding ground for malaria. And malaria didn't just slow operations, it crippled them. In the early stages of the Burma campaign, for every British or Commonwealth soldier pulled from the line because of wounds, more than a hundred were evacuated because of disease. It was a theater where nature punished armies harder than bullets did, and it forced British planners to rethink what air power needed to look like in Southeast Asia. That's where an unlikely connection appears. Malaria leads you straight to the mosquito, and in Britain's case, to the mosquito the de Havilland twin-engine wooden marvel that had already earned a reputation as one of the most versatile aircraft of the war. Reconnaissance, strike missions, night fighting, precision bombing, the Mosquito did it all, and it did it fast, thanks to its lightweight wooden construction and powerful Merlin engines. That combination of speed, range, and agility became the template. The Mosquito wasn't just a successful aircraft, it was the philosophical foundation for what would soon become Britain's next great fighter, the Hornet. Building on the Mosquito's success, British designers knew exactly what the next step had to be. The Pacific Theater demanded more than a fast strike aircraft. It needed a true long-range fighter, something that could chase down a Zero, escort bombers for hours at a time, and still climb and turn with the best machines in the sky. That meant raising the bar on every front. The new aircraft had to be faster, more agile, longer-legged, and lighter than anything Britain had fielded so far. De Havilland already had the right philosophy on the drawing board. The Mosquito's wooden airframe, its smooth aerodynamic lines, and its remarkable power-to-weight ratio offered a proven foundation. But the Hornet wasn't simply a smaller Mosquito. It was a complete reinterpretation of the concept, stripped down, tightened up, and engineered specifically for air combat and escort duty. The fuselage was slimmer, the wings were cleaner, 
and the entire airframe was refined to reduce drag as much as possible. Weight was trimmed wherever engineers could safely do it, giving the aircraft a lively, responsive feel that a heavy bomber-derived platform could never achieve. And at the heart of it all sat a new generation of Merlin engines, the 130 and 131 series, tuned specifically for the Hornet, delivering more power in a more compact package. In essence, de Havilland took the spirit of the Mosquito and distilled it into a pure fighter, a machine built to outrun, outclimb, and outlast anything the Pacific could throw at it. If the Hornet's design philosophy came from the Mosquito, its construction was the next evolution of that wooden miracle. De Havilland had refined the art of building fast, lightweight airframes without relying on heavy metal structures, and the Hornet became their most advanced expression of that craft. The fuselage was built from two large wooden shells, one left half, one right, each shaped from layers of balsa and spruce. These were bonded together using Aerolite, a high-strength synthetic adhesive that allowed the frame to remain both incredibly light and remarkably rigid. This method wasn't just efficient, it created an exceptionally smooth exterior surface, eliminating many of the seams and rivets that added drag to traditional metal fighters. The wings took the concept even further. The upper surfaces were crafted from birch and balsa plywood, keeping weight down while maintaining structural stiffness. The lower surfaces, however, were made from alclad aluminum alloy, a material chosen for its durability and resistance to corrosion. Instead of being bolted on, these metal panels were glued to the wooden structure using a new adhesive called Redux. The result was a strong, clean bond that avoided the turbulence creating edges of screws or rivets, giving the Hornet a noticeably cleaner aerodynamic profile. But the airframe wasn't just light, it was tough. Engineers reinforced the wing spars and main structure to handle higher G-loads, drawing directly from combat experience with high-performance fighters like the Hawker Tempest and the North American Mustang. These reinforcements allowed the Hornet to dive harder, pull tighter, and fight with confidence at high speeds. Everything about the airplane's shape, from its narrow fuselage to its thin, optimized wings, was designed to cut through the air with as little resistance as possible. The Hornet wasn't just streamlined, it was purpose-built for speed, the entire airframe sculpted to squeeze every last mile per hour out of those Merlin engines. All that careful engineering paid off the moment the Hornet left the runway. In level flight, the aircraft could reach 485 miles per hour, placing it among the very fastest piston engine fighters ever built anywhere in the world. And it wasn't a dive number or a one-off test figure. That speed was repeatable, reliable, and achievable without resorting to clipped wings or experimental tuning. For a frontline fighter designed in wartime, that was extraordinary. Range was another standout. With drop tanks hung under the wings, the Hornet could stretch its legs to nearly 2,500 miles, a figure that put it in a completely different league from most fighters of its generation. At a time when long-range escort missions defined the Pacific Air War, few piston aircraft could even come close. The service ceiling, about 41,000 feet, gave it the altitude performance needed to stalk reconnaissance planes, bombers, or high-flying interceptors with ease. When it came time to fight, the Hornet carried a concentrated punch, four Hispano 20mm cannons mounted in the lower nose. This setup kept recoil centered and firing runs steady, giving the aircraft the kind of hard-hitting accuracy pilots valued in both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground roles. Stacked against its contemporaries, the Hornet stands out even more. It was faster than nearly every Allied or Axis piston fighter ever to see service, and only Germany's late war DO-335 could realistically challenge it in straight-line speed. Even jet aircraft of the same period couldn't compete in endurance. The P-80 Shooting Star and Mi-262 were groundbreaking, but their short ranges, typically a few hundred miles, left them tied to nearby airfields. The Hornet, meanwhile, could roam across oceans, and thanks to its lightweight wooden frame and finely tuned Merlins, the Hornet handled beautifully. Pilots described it as crisp, responsive, and agile in a fight. 
speed, range, maneuverability, firepower, the Hornet didn't just excel in one category, it delivered all four at once, making it one of the most balanced and capable piston fighters ever engineered. For all its promise, the Hornet's greatest enemy turned out to be timing. De Havilland moved with impressive speed. Just 13 months passed between the green light for development and the first prototype taking to the air. Production followed soon after, with the initial aircraft completed in late 1944, right as the war in Europe was drawing to a close. But wars don't wait for engineering schedules. By the time the Hornet reached frontline units in 1946, Japan had already surrendered. The fighter that had been built with the Pacific in mind never saw the Pacific at all. No island hopping missions, no zero encounters, no long-range escorts into hostile skies. Its original purpose evaporated before the first squadron received its aircraft. In the years that followed, the Hornet carved out a quieter, almost understated place in aviation history. It appeared in air races and record attempts, most notably setting a blistering long-distance speed mark on the Britain to Gibraltar route. It even flew one tense mission in 1954, when two Hornets were dispatched to protect a British C-54 transport that had been attacked and forced down by Chinese forces, a brief brush with danger that never escalated into combat. Ultimately, the jet age closed in. Sleek new machines like the de Havilland Vampire replaced the Hornet in frontline service, pushing piston power out of the spotlight for good. The Hornet had all the right qualities, just not the right moment in history. Even as the standard Hornet settled into its brief post-war career, de Havilland pressed ahead with a navalized version designed for carrier decks, the Sea Hornet. Three main variants emerged, the Mark 20, Mark 21, and Mark 22, each adapted to the unique demands of fleet air arm operations. These models carried the familiar Hornet sleekness, but added the essentials of carrier life, a sturdy tail hook for arrested landings, strengthened landing gear to absorb the brutal shock of deck touchdowns, and in the later marks, specialized equipment for night fighting and photo reconnaissance missions. Yet even with these enhancements, the Sea Hornet lived a life much like its land-based sibling. It never saw combat. Instead, it spent its years flying patrols, training exercises, and routine carrier operations, serving reliably but quietly as the jet revolution swept across naval aviation. Still, no story of the Hornet is complete without one man, Captain Eric Winkle Brown, the most accomplished test pilot in British history and one of the most experienced aviators the world has ever known. Brown flew nearly 500 different aircraft types in his lifetime, and among them, the Hornet stood out. He described its climb as rocket-like, its handling as beautifully balanced, and the overall experience as sheer exhilarating flying enjoyment. High praise from a man who had flown everything from Mustangs to Messerschmitts to early jets. Today, not a single complete Hornet or Sea Hornet survives. Only fragments, drawings, and a handful of restoration projects keep its memory alive. But its legacy is crystal clear. The Hornet represents the final pinnacle of British piston engine fighter design, a masterpiece born at the very moment its era was ending. A brilliant aircraft caught between two ages. If you enjoyed this look back at a forgotten legend, don't forget to like, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe for more stories from aviation's golden years.